why Jesus over every other path, every other religion, and every other form of spirituality? This is a question that is a, is something that every person who claims to, to follow Jesus needs to ask themselves and um, needs to be comfortable with that answer because we only live a very short period of time while we're here. You know, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. Some of us go earlier. And, um, and the answer to the question, why are we here, um, what is the purpose for life and where are we going, is something every one of us should seek to answer. We, um, you know, we spend a lot of our time growing up, going to school to prepare for a career. And we invest that time to prepare for a career that will earn us money. But what happens after um, this life? Is there another life? Um, and do the actions that we perform in this life uh, make any difference in determining where we're going to be in the next or whether there's one at all? Now, a lot of there's different types of um, answers to this question. Why are we here? Some people say there is no why. Some people say there is no reason or rhyme to our existence where we're in fact purposeless chemical uh, byproducts of, of a chemical reaction that happened billions of years ago and, and here we are. And, and to that, there is no why. There is no purpose except objectively there's none. There's something that we can make for ourselves. There's something that relatively speaking or subjectively speaking we can we can determine within ourselves and this is where the idea of relativity of truth comes from and my truth and your truth and we all have different truths because we all determine our own truth because truth isn't something that's objective. It's it's something that when it comes to purpose at least, it's something that we define. So that's one option. For me, um, I've really thought about that quite deeply, the idea that, that atheism um, is it a valid option? Is it, and and if if atheism is true, you know, I'm, I'm, my personal belief is that I want to know what is true, not not what is convenient. Some people, when they look for paths, or when they look for religions, or when they look for spirituality, it's more about application. It's more about what are the benefits? Does it help me achieve a more enjoyable life or achieve a more happy life? Well, that that that's one thing, and that's important. But for me, even more important than that is what is actually true. You know, is it really true that we are, that we have no purpose? Is that true? And if it is, I want to fully believe it. Whatever is true, that's what I want to believe. Um, and I guess for atheism, the idea that, that there was no mind behind everything is a huge leap of faith that I, that I don't have the ability to, to, to leap that far, I guess you could say. Because... Um, my observational experience tells me that when I see order and complexity and intricate, intricate detail, there's a mind um, without wavering. There is always a mind behind that complexity and that detail. As a software programmer and developer for the last 13 years, I, I work on information systems that always um, come from a mind. And even with the emergence of artificial intelligence, um, those machine learning algorithms don't arrive by themselves. They, they, the environment in which they learn, those networks were designed by a mind. And so all of these systems, regardless of how they came to be, there's a mind behind them. There's a form of intelligence behind them. And so... And so what we observe in the universe, as complex as it is, just points in, my, it points in every which way to a very, very intelligent mind um, as the originator and driving force for the extremely complex systems that we see, which are far more complicated and intricate and interdependent than any of us realize. Um, and that's just what we understand. And then there's the things that we don't understand, the, the nature of the, the smallest components as we drill down into the cell and into the, 
into into electron uh, you know into into the atom and, and we're looking at these tiny little things that exist and how they work together and then even now with the emergence of quantum um, understanding and how limited that is at this point um, we we just do not understand how it works but we know that it is interdependent and we know that everything seems to be connected through systems and I tell you what if you've worked on any form of um, information system when things uh, multiple systems interconnect it takes incredible intelligence and when some, it's so easy for things to go wrong and it takes a lot of complexity and order and well thought out design and intelligence to maintain those systems. You know, the Bible says, and we'll get into why the Bible, why I believe the Bible is true, but there's a verse that talks about how in him we live and we breathe and we have our being and he sustains and holds everything together. Um, and so this idea that, that non-intelligence somehow brought in, it into existence and everything is hung together by no mind, that it's all purposeless is just the biggest leap of faith that, that that one could take. And I think, in fact, it is the most difficult thing to believe, atheism. So for me, that's why atheism is totally ruled out. I couldn't, I could never be an, be an atheist because the faith required to be an atheist is just devastating. Um, not because of its application, the application and the negative effects of what atheism entails that's also devastating but that's not what it, that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about whether it's true or not not the moral ramifications that's a totally separate subject and I'm not even talking about that right now I'm talking about what is actually true I could never be an atheist for that reason um, the universe is far too well designed far too well ordered far too well there's far too many interdependent systems that require intelligence to maintain and and to create in the first place. Um, so that's that's one point, atheism. The next point is okay. So now we've gone from atheism to theism, um, or, or, or you know, some people believe in deism, uh, which is the idea that there is a deity out there, but he's not, but he or she or it or a poly, polytheistic thing isn't that interested in what it is that they created. Um, is there evidence that? Um, that there is a being out there or multiple beings out there that are interested. Um, and so this is where the, where you have to arrive, okay? Okay, so you've got two options. You've got the idea that there's, um, you know, something has to be eternal. So we're, we're bound to time, space-time. That's what we observe. We have a, you know, in our mind, in the way that we think, there's a linear line. And along that line is time and we're living through time and we're aging. Um, and we all live, we're born, we die. Um, and so the question is, well, what's after it? But but we kind of think of it linearly. There's a beginning and there's an end. So there's two options, you know, um, time. Um, something must have brought about the existence of space, time and matter. We know that to some degree time, and, and this is what, what we've observed um, in the last hundred or so years, um, is the idea of relativity of time. And how time, you know, gravity and mass and, and these things can dilate time and change the rate at which time elapses or ticks. Um, but but in my mind, time is something that was either create, you know, even the idea of thinking about well, what created time, you know, imp implies a beginning to time. It, it, it's something that we find very difficult to understand because to even think of the concept of a beginning of time implies time. But that aside, try to, trying to put our limitations aside and our understandings aside, whatever it was that brought about time has to not be limited by it. It has to not be constrained by it. It must transcend it. And so you've, we've only got really two options. We've got an eternal regression of creators or gods or deities, um, if, if that's what we'd like to call them, an eternal regression, which means there was a God that created another God who created another God, and it's in an infinite cycle. Op that's option number one. Option number two is that there is one eternal God. You've got an, a, a regression of gods or one eternal God. Um, and so they're the options. Um, Hinduism, there's a lot of deities, and it's not just one who created another who created another. There's just lots of them. Um, but the, there's this idea that everything just goes round and round and round and round in circles infinitely. 
Um, so Hinduism, that's an option. People choose that as an option. People choose that as their belief and their preferred path. And there's a lot of Hindus out there. Um, and so that's one option. Then you've got Islam, which is theistic and one deity. And you've got the idea that there's only one God. Um, but it's very specific about the details. And, you know, 600 AD, Muhammad came along and, and he had his revelation um, or supposed or claimed revelation that an, that an angel, um, Gabriel, approached him. Um, and while he was in a cave on a mountain, Horeb, and revealed to him certain things and, um, you know, claimed that the prophets of the Bible were accurate, but that um, he had a new message and a better message and, and expanded upon that. And, and the, you know, out of that experience over the years, we, we you know, the Quran came about and later the Hadiths. Um, and anyway, so Islam, that's an option. A lot of people pick that option. Um, but the, but, you know, and there's many others. There's Buddhism, Buddhism, Buddha came along and he didn't claim to be God or no God, but he claimed to bring a way. And people pick that option, Buddhism. Um, but when you investigate these these different religions independently, and I'm, I'm not going to hide the fact that I was brought up as a Christian, um, and for me, if Christianity is true, I want to believe it. But if it's not true, I legitimately don't want to believe it. You know, if, if, if Islam was true, that's what I would really pick because if it was true... Um, regardless of the effects that it has, if it was the truth, then I believe that the truth will lead you in the right direction, um, despite what you may think about the ramifications. It's the same with atheism. It's the same with, with theism or deism or whatever it is you pick. So to me, it's not about, I'm not even thinking about what it is they believe in the sense of what, what is truly moral um, and what is our purpose. I'm thinking about it is what is actually true. Now, the unique thing with Christianity um, is the claim um, in a person. So, as most people know who are watching this video, Christianity um, came out of Judaism. So, we've got Genesis. Um, we've got the Torah, the first five books of Moses, who Moses wrote these books down. Uh, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're, they're these five books um, contained within them is the origin of the universe, the one who created it, the, the, you know, basically a timeline from our greatest ancestor. And, and by the way, Islam also um, takes, you know, those books and, and believes that, you know, Genesis, uh, you know, is a book as well. And mo they believe Moses was a prophet. So there are similarities there. Um, but you've got a claim, you've got a historical claim that, that the greatest grandparent of all of us was a guy called Adam and he had a wife called Eve who was created from his rib by God himself, right? That's a claim. And it's, it, you know, no matter which religion you pick, there's a bunch of claims that are, that are extraordinary and you could say supernatural because they are super, they supersede nature, they transcend nature. And some people reject these books or religions on the basis that they're not entirely materialistic or naturalistic. Philosophically, that is a um, an, a philosophical error, because no matter what you pick, if you pick atheism, you have to come up with a, whatever it is that brought nature into into being or existence cannot be limited by the nature that didn't yet exist. I'll say that again. Whatever it was that brought nature into existence cannot be limited by the nature that did not yet exist. It had to transcend it. It necessarily had to be supernatural. And so the idea that a God can create a human being from dirt or dust is supernatural, but it's necessary that whatever created the universe, the stars, the planets, time, space, time, and matter, had to transcend all of that. So if he didn't transcend all of that, he could never create it. If he, if he didn't transcend time, he couldn't create time. If he didn't transcend space, and, and, and in fact be spaceless, 
um, then he'd be limited by the constraints of that thing. And that's a logical impossibility. Whatever it was that created these things had to transcend them. And so the description of the God of the Bible actually philosophically makes perfect sense. And when it comes to Islam, you know, and so Islam will tick that box as well in the sense that, you know, it endorses Moses as a prophet. It endorses his writings about the origins of the universe and the God who created it. It diverges later. Um, so the Bible claims that there was a God who, who, who was outside of the boundaries of time. In the beginning, Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the heavens being space and also what transcends space um, and also the sky. He created that and the earth. And then it goes on to describe how we did it, you know, on different, different days, so to speak. He created these different things. He created the stars. He created you know, the grass, the, the, um, he created the animals and the birds and the, and, and on day six, he created humans from the dust of the earth. So is it true though? Is it true? And so, you know, we have these stories about the origins of the universe, Genesis and the Jewish people believed it. Um, we have the lineage and history from Adam all the way down to Noah, 10 generations of people who lived long ages, lived a long time. And then we've got different, um, different groups of people all over the world with stories about how people used to live longer. Um, and then, of course, the big flood event that a lot of us know about that, that the book of, book of Genesis describes as a flood that, that covered every mountain under the sky or under the heavens, um, of which there are over 300 different stories with incredibly similar details about an event that was very similar coming out of every continent on the planet, except for maybe Antarctica. Um, and so you've got these events in history that are recorded and cultures all over the world that seem to record similar events. And, you know, you work, so this is how, this is how you process these things. Like is, you know, are there crazy claims in the Bible that transcend what we see? Absolutely. And sometimes people take what they call a calm, a calm's razor and they try to apply it to the supernatural claims recorded in the Bible, um, specifically about origins, but also there are also intervening um, what we call miracles, where God intervenes into human history and does something that transcends the laws of nature. Um, and so people try to take Occam's razor and apply it to these events and say, well, what's more probable? Um, and that doesn't work, and I'll tell you why. Occam's razor always errors on the side of what's most naturalistically probable. Um, and if there is a supernatural God, if, hypothetically, and he does intervene with the thing that he created on occasion, then a calm's razor necessarily cannot ever come up with a, um, an accurately true result in those situations because it is entirely naturalistic and probabilistic. And so it, it, it works in probabilities based on what we observe in nature on a regular basis. And so if on occasion there is a God that transcends the universe, which, which makes sense, and an atheism of course doesn't from a, from a philosophical point of view, um, then a calm's razor cannot work. And so it is a faith thing. You do have to have an element of faith when you're reading events that supposedly happened throughout history um, that transcended the laws of nature, there is an element of faith involved, but it's not, a, but it doesn't have to be faith without facts. It doesn't have to be faith without evidence. And this is where there are many things in the Bible from our point of view that cannot be verified as in, in the sense that we cannot go back in time and see the events happen. All we can do is look at what people claim to have happened. But there is a thing that we can do. We can prove some things. There are things that we can prove um, by analyzing what has happened historically in the past and looking at what other people have observed and written, not just one person, but a multitude of eyewitnesses. And so this is where the reliability of Jesus comes into play. So you've got the whole Old Testament. So you've got, you know, one and a half thousand years of history from Genesis, from Moses writing Genesis. But, but when he wrote Genesis, he talked about what happened 6,000 or so years ago, um, or, or some people believe it might be a little bit more, but, um, so you've, 
so when when we look at this stuff, so when we go back and we look at Jesus, okay, so we can't prove ourselves, and this is this is just me thinking out loud. We can't prove Genesis, we can't prove Exodus, we can't prove Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and all these events, Joshua, um, you know, and how they defeated the Canaanites. But we can look at archaeological evidence and say, were the Israelites in Egypt as slaves and captives? Yeah, they were. So Exodus, a lot of the events in Exodus have roots in archaeological history. Does that mean that everything that Exodus says happened, happened? As someone who's neutral, not necessarily. Um, But did the Israelites go through the Red Sea at a point in time and escape the Egyptians? There's archaeological evidence that suggests, yes, they did. Was there something that came and, and caused all kinds of plagues in the region? There's a lot of evidence says that, that says that they did. Um, did Moses strike a rock with his staff and cause water to come out? There's no archaeological evidence that you could expect to prove that. And so things like that you have to take on faith. The faith of the person who wrote the book. Um, the verbal oral tradition of history that was relayed from gener- one generation to the next. There are certain things you do have to take on faith. There are some things that are that are, that validate the story, like archaeological evidence. So, so you can kind of so you read through the Old Testament, you read all these stories, you read and understand what these prophets have said and predicted, um, and then you say, okay, there's been some guys that have come along who who have said that certain things will happen in the future, right? And um, the evidence of whether a prophet is a prophet is whether the predictions came true or not. If they fault, if they were false, then obviously they're, they're not even a true prophet, right? They're a false prophet. Um, but there's a bunch of guys in the Bible that predicted things that would happen in the future that we can now, in hindsight, look back in history um, and know without a shadow of a doubt that the things that they said would happen in detail, extreme detail, by the way, that they actually happened. And not, and these aren't prophecies that are ambiguous. These aren't vague. These aren't wishy-washy prophecies where you could make them to say whatever you wanted them to say. These are extremely detailed prophecies. And there's also the fact that the events that they said would happen um, were recorded to have happened not just by one person, but by many people. And it's also true that these events were written down and translated into multiple languages um, hundreds of years before the events actually took place. Um, In fact, you might have heard of uh, Alexander the Great, who went and conquered much of the world. He divided his empire up into four different uh, zones, you could say. And and, um, one of the guys um, who took um, the region of kind of Egypt area um, he he handed his kingdom over to another guy. And, th- and, and so eventually there came a guy um, from that lineage called King Artaxerxes Longomanus. And you can go and check this. And he uh, ordered for a bunch of Hebrew scholars to come and translate the Hebrew Old Testament Bible uh, from Genesis all the way through um so the whole Hebrew Bible to translate it into the Greek language because he was curious. He wanted to know what it said and he wanted it to be accurate. And so he got a bunch of guys together to perform that translation. And today, uh, um, you know, scholars uh, refer to this translation as the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, which is totally in Greek. And in fact, when Jesus came along in his day and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and which were like the experts of of the law. Um, Yes, they had Hebrew scrolls, but many of them also read the Greek 
manuscripts because remember they were living in the Roman Empire and they spoke that language and so yes they had the Hebrew the ancient Hebrew scripts but then they also had the Greek copies which were over 300 years old um, of the Hebrew Bible all in Greek and so contained within the body of this text that was translated verifiably um, by all of historians um, were details of a guy, you know, over 300 prophecies about one guy, you know, this Messiah that that people were looking forward to for thousands of years, literally thousands of years, looking forward to a Messiah, a Savior, so to, you know, so to speak, who would come and deal with the problem that their, that our greatest grandparents started, which was the introduction of of um of death. Um, and this is the claim of the Bible that once there was no death, there, there was a time where death didn't exist. And then came along um, this idea of rebellion where man rebelled against the creator and in so doing sin into the world and death through sin. And so there, there's this promise of a coming savior, coming Messiah, coming person who would come and undo death. Right. And so, and this is the claim of Christianity and, and so there's all these details, extremely detailed, extremely specific, over 300 of these details. And they came along, and I've written down some of them. I'm just going to just um, quickly quickly scroll through. You've got this idea of lineage. So, you know, um, these, you know, people prophesied that, that the coming Messiah would be a descendant of a particular person. And this person was actually a real king of Israel. Who, who ruled over Israel in a powerful way. And a lot of us heard the story of David and Goliath, this little kid with a slingshot, throwing this thing round, hits this, this giant dude, nine foot tall guy in the head, kills him and wins a war for the nation. This kid grew up and actually became eventually the king. He was a little shepherd kid, but then he became the king of Israel. And God spoke through a prophet and said, you know, you've, you've got my heart, David. You've got the same kind of heart as me. And so I'm going to bring about the guy who will save the world, save humanity, is going to come through your seed, come through your generations, come through your lineage. And, and it did. So it says, King David, along with the prophets Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all predicted that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. And you can read about that in Second Samuel 7, Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 23. 3 and Psalm 89 are some examples. Um, other people predicted Isaiah qualified the Messiah to be born um, of someone who was actually a virgin, like a total virgin. Um, um, others predicted like Micah, Micah 5 said he'll be born in Bethlehem. Um, Hosea prophesied the Messiah will travel to Egypt as a kid. Isaiah said that this, this Messiah will heal the sick. Um, Isaiah 29, Isaiah 35, um, he'll deliver spiritual captives, people, you know, who, who are spiritually held captives. And all the eyewitnesses talk heavily about the fact that he healed people miraculously and he delivered people from demonic spirits. All the eyewitnesses record these details. Um, you can read about that in I, um, Isaiah 61. Um, and as I said before, King Artaxerxes um, had all of these... Um, these predictions and prophecies translated um, hundreds of years before a really powerful one, um, which I've shared with some people before. And you might've heard is Daniel talking about, in fact, the exact day of the arrival of, of the Messiah. And I'll just read out what I've written here. The prophet Daniel had an encounter with an angel from God, Daniel nine. The context of this visit was that Jerusalem had been taken captive, destroyed by the Babylonians Daniel was one of the prisoners of war, a Babylonian captive, and the angel said that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. And from the day the command goes out to restore and rebuild it until the day the Messiah arrives, there'll be exactly 483 years, which are Jewish years, which is 360 days, which is in fact 173,880 days. And that's so specific. And um, historically, we know that... Um, um, there's a guy, and so, sorry, I got my names mixed up earlier. Um, King, It's King Artaxerxes Longomanus that gave the command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. He wasn't the one who gave the command to translate um, this, the Hebrew text into the Septuagint. Um, that was somebody else. 
But King Artaxerxes gave the command um, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And from that date, um, if you count um, count the days, 173,880 days, you get to a point in history where Jesus uh, enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey, which, by the way, um, also was a prophet was prophesied in Ze- by the prophet Zechariah, saying he would he would come on a donkey, not on a horse, not as a, as a as a powerful person, but as a humble person. Um, and so and so again, like there's so many, there's 300 of these details. It says he'll be despised and rejected, despised and rejected. He'll be rejected by the rulers. Psalm 118. Um, he'll be hated without cause. Psalm 69, Isaiah 49, um, Isaiah 53 is, talks about how, how he would be despised and rejected. It says he'll be crucified, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. Um, and these all different different prophets have predicted these details. Um, he'll be buried with the rich, um, Isaiah 53. But again, he was from a poor, poor family, poor village. He'll be raised from the dead, Psalm 16. All of this... Um, was written down way before his life, way before he was born, hundreds of years before he was even um, a human being on the earth. And of course, when we go back and we look at the eyewitnesses and uh, and we record what these people claim to have seen and um, and doctors had gone and interviewed all these people and written down what, what they had said they had seen. Um, and then the fact that all of a lot of these people... Um, actually went to their, were killed, cru- uh, you know, martyred for claiming to have witnessed this stuff and for claiming to have visibly seen Jesus raised from the dead and for claiming to have seen him heal the sick and, and cast demons out of people and um, arrive in Jerusalem on the day that he did. And, and so all of these details they claim to have seen and they died for it. And, and they died for it. Not just one person, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who were eyewitnesses died for what they claimed to have been true. And so uh, we're coming back to this question. We've got this history. We've got this evidence. We've got this evidence that points to towards the fact that the authors of these manuscripts seem to have known the future before it happened, which is an attribute of, 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 of someone being in connection with someone, at least, who transcends the boundaries of time. This is what prophecy is. And in this detail, someone who's outside of time. And, and if we go back to the, to the idea of, of whoever it was that created the universe and time and space and matter had to transcend it, it all points very powerfully and strongly to the fact that the author of these scripts um, transcends time, right? But also, what did Jesus say? He, he said that, that before Abraham was, I am. And so all of a sudden he becomes really um, credible. His, his words become credible, not because he, he's just this guy who's charismatic and, 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 you know, like a guy like a Buddha who came and he really, you know, might, might have done some great things in the world. Um, Jesus is on a whole nother level. And, and he also claimed to be God. Before Abraham was, he says, I am, which is a reference to, to Exodus and the burning bush experience that Moses had where Moses asked God at the burning bush, who are you? And God said, I am who I am. Go and tell them I am. And so Jesus claimed that before Abraham was, you know, Abraham was a descendant from Adam to Noah and then from Noah to Abraham, um, the many generations between them. Jesus is before Abraham, before Israel you know, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob, who was renamed to Israel. So the nation of Israel was named after Israel, whose granddad was Abraham. And Jesus said, talking about this nation's granddad, before him, I am. In other words, he is the one. He's claiming to be the guy who created the universe. Later in the New Testament, it talks about how through Jesus, in all things were made, things in heaven and things on earth, and that God became a man, a human being. This was communicated um, so this is powerful stuff and it's evidence based. Um, and so you can pick from lots of different paths. You can pick based on what you want to be true, right? You can pick, uh, you know, there's many paths, many religions, many forms of spirituality, which might look nice and sound nice and feel nice and cater to what you want to be true and cater to, to your subjective definition of what you think morality should be. 
But then there's Jesus and this Christianity. And Jesus comes along and says, do not lean on your own heart. Do not trust in your own understanding. The heart is above all else desperately wicked. And there's a better way. Trust me. And, and so when you look at Jesus, he's far more reliable, far more trustworthy, far more honorable than, than I am, far and, and, and historic, archaeologically verified, the, you know, and people often took about manuscript evidences and, you know, how can we even trust that they were accurately translated and preserved and, and go and look into that. There's 5,000, over 5,000, almost 6,000 manuscripts, tra- you know, translated, um, just of the New Testament alone, and and they date right back to the early times of of that first century, and and they've been preserved incredibly well. And even in fact, we have manuscripts that are that are in their original um, or extremely close to it form. So um, we have so much evidence, more so than any other religion in the world. Um, and so, why do I believe what I believe? I believe Jesus, and I believe Christianity because. Because it is the most reliable thing that I've ever found. And then I look at what is moral and true, not based on what I want to be moral and true. I, I, I look at Jesus and I say, Jesus, what do you say is moral and true? You are the guy who created the universe. You are the God who created the world. I believe that. I trust that. I think there's evidence for that. But there's also elements where my faith has to come into play. But there's also elements where I don't need a lot of faith because there's so much evidence. So I can trust Jesus. And then he tells me what he believes is moral and true and right. Um, And then our culture comes and opposes it. Who am I going to believe? Who am I going to trust? Our culture is disintegrating. Our culture is, you know, the God who created the universe, the system, gets to define the rules of the system. And then he makes a promise. He says... Um, he who believes in me, though he die, he will live. In other words, we, you know, God's numbered our days. We have a number of days on the earth. Though we die, there's going to be a resurrection. And Jesus has made a way, and this is the central message of the New Testament, that the whole purpose of Jesus coming, God entering human history and becoming a man, was to deal with the sin problem and the death problem. He can forgive our sin. He can forgive our rebellion. He can forgive our mistakes. And then he can come and he can change our heart and make it um, different so that our goal and our aspiration is to please him and serve him. And then he sends his Holy Spirit to help us achieve that goal because we can't do it on our own. And if we repent and believe, repent of our, our rebellion and trust in our creator, we begin to, to fulfill the purpose that he, that he created us for. He's got a purpose for us on this earth. It's a short blip of vapor of, of steam, and that's how long we have to live on this earth, and then we're in eternity. In eternity, the Bible has a lot to say about that. It talks about an amazing place after death for those that um, trust in their creator. And it talks about a terrible prison-like place for those that reject and re- reject God continuously, and rebel against him and do not accept the free gift of salvation that he freely offers. And he's got way out of his way to leave his heavenly throne, enter the earth and, and come and, and come and be with us and die in our place and, and be raised from the dead. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a poem that I wrote years ago. Um, and it goes like this creation, Christ, complex, credible creativity, constant stability, the possibility of only an intelligent facility to bring together d- the designed order that we know so intuitively segregated from truth and elevated despite proof, manipulated, subjugated. There was a bias that separated the mind and the soul of man from God. You see an atheist, um, uh, you know, the atheist positions their mind and they say that, Unless God can be understood, that they won't they won't believe in the divine. But our minds themselves, they were created. Simply stated, God is far bigger than anything that could possibly be contemplated. You see, there was a manipulated mind that became biased because of the crime, because of our crimes and the evil in this world. It's a great clear sign that we have rebelled against our Maker, the God who made us. Um, we declared war in our hearts, placing us in danger. But then hope came in the form of a baby in a manger. God became a man. He he, beca- he entered among human beings. And for the first time, grace and truth is what we started seeing. So it's wise to repent of our sins and start fleeing the wrath and the justice of God to come. 
by putting our faith and trust in his one and only begotten son. Um, He laid down his life for our sins on the cross. Um, His passion was to seek out and save those that were lost. Um, um, He was raised from the dead, this same God who bled, and he was raised incorruptible, now forever indestructible. And he ascended into heaven and now makes intercession. And for those who believe they've been given this concession, as many as receive him, God's only begotten son, they're given a right to be called a child of God by the father of God, who is love. So this is the verdict. God entered the world um, and he, he laid down his life for our sins on the cross. He, he was, his passion was to seek and save the lost. His blood was shed from the cross. It bled and our sins were exchanged for his righteousness. But there's more to be said. He was buried in a tomb, this same God who was conceived in his mother's womb by the spirit of the Lord, not too late, nor too soon, but at just the right moment, this life changing component, the gospel of salvation made possible through the atonement. So the command goes out and it's this. We should apologize to God for the things we've done wrong. We should put our faith and trust in his only begotten son. We should receive the Holy Spirit whom he freely sends from above and abide forever and ever in this eternal God who is love. And so this is this is this um, the poem that that, that um, I wrote years ago, but it articulates the message of the gospel, and it shows um, kind of how we can, in our minds, make ourselves enemies against God in our minds. Um, but God loves us. This is the truth, and a lot of people find that Christianity is extremely intolerant, um, and it is. It doesn't tolerate other ideas. Not all ideas are created equal. Um, God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And that is extremely exclusive. Jesus said there's one path, and it's narrow and thin, and there are few who find it, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are going in by it. And so, yeah, Jesus wasn't a tolerant person. A lot of people hated him, but those that accepted him loved him because he saved their life. And those who have a relationship with God love God because he saved their life. And it's, well, where else can we go? We know that in Jesus alone is eternal life and we have to lay it down. Does that mean that we're judging of other people as Christians? I'm not judging anyone, but God has judged them in the sense that God has made a moral judgment about the way that we live our lives and he has rendered us all guilty. Is that true or is that false? If it's false, then go on and live your life and don't be affected by it. But if it's true, then let's do something about it. The question isn't, what do I want to be true? It's what is true. What it's not what I want to be true. It's not what I, what do I want to be the truth in this life? If you know, and and some people have used the analogy of standing on a highway, you know, and you know, it might be enjoyable I don't know why that would ever be enjoyable, but let's just say standing on a highway was really enjoyable and a big truck was coming. You're still going to jump out of the way, right? If you believe that this truck is going to hit you, you're going to get out of the way. It's not about trying to drown out all of the things that show you whether it's true or not. You've got to get to the truth. Is there a truck coming or not? Am I going to stand before God and give an account for the things that I've done in my body or not? Is there going to be someone who holds everyone accountable, especially for the really bad things, but even for the smaller things? Is there someone who's going to hold us accountable? Jesus says there is. Jesus says he will judge the world. Do you believe it? And if you do, then let's get out that Bible and read what he said and let's change the way that we live. Um, in alignment of that if it's not true if you're not convinced then then you know can you know try to then then i have another question for you well what do you believe and what are the reasons why that you know why is that more reliable than jesus is it more reliable Um, are you picking something less reliable you know what is it that you believe if you believe islam's more reliable why you know why do you believe it's more reliable i've had many conversations with with many Muslims and um, and and found and, you know and found Jesus to be more and more and more reliable. The more the more I look into Islam, the more 
unreliable I find that it is. And often Islam points to Jesus as well in many of its texts saying that he is a prophet of God. And if he's a prophet of God, then, then you have to trust what he says, right? And you look into Buddhism, you look into Hinduism, um, you look into atheism, you look at agnosticism, you look into Satanism. There's so many options. And then you look into materialism where people just ignore it. Um, or, you know, just try to um, just focus on, on the here and now and getting rich and, and not paying much attention or agnosticism, I guess. Um, in my study, in my pursuit, those are not anywhere near as reliable as Jesus. So who is the most reliable, um, you know, and also apart from all of your own research and all of that, um, why not pray? <laughs> um in the secret place where where it's just you and you know if you get to a point where you realize okay there's probably extremely low neck if not no chance that this universe came to about without an intelligent being behind it um to, in my mind there's no chance of that even being possible pray there must be a deity out there if it's deistic he's not going to be interested in you but if it's theistic then it is going to be interested in you he she whatever it is um in your mind um Pray, but don't just pray, you know, and my what I'm advocating for is the God of the Bible is a he. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy, set apart, be your name. May your kingdom come, the kingdom of heaven come on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's will here. And laying down our own, laying down our own, God's will in me, God's will in others. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me out today, give me, give me daily bread, food, water, sustain my needs, um, and forgive me of my sins, my rebellion against God, my, my falling short. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the king's domain over the earth. Yours is all power, and that's a statement of truth. It's a fact. God is all powerful. He created the universe and everything in it. He's not intimidated by anything he created. Yours is the power and the glory, as in we worship him, we give him glory, um, not because we're able to give him anything. It's just something that he deserves. He is amazing forever and ever and ever. Amen. And when you say amen, it means I agree. That's how Jesus said to pray. So my encouragement is, Jesus said, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who seeks me with all their heart will find me. And I can testify that is absolutely true. And I'm not saying, I'm not doing this video for any reason apart from the fact that Jesus, I can say this for a fact, and because I have a personal relationship with God, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he loves you and he wants a relationship with you and um, and he wants you in his kingdom. He's not willing, he doesn't want anyone to perish but for everyone to come to repentance. So God bless and I want to just encourage everyone with this message. Bless you in Jesus' name.